Thank you for joining me today. My name is Alana Church, and I am a molecular and pediatric pathologist practicing at Boston Children's Hospital and at Harvard Medical School. We have the opportunity today to review an important core concept in genetics. What do we mean when we describe germline and somatic genetic findings? First, let's review the concept of genetic variation. As a clinician, I often think about genetic variation in the context of a patient's disease, but it really just means a difference from one organism to another. Determining whether a variant or alteration is significant biologically or to a patient's disease is another matter, and there are a variety of ways that we would approach that process. For now, let's just agree that a variant means a difference. In practice, we are fortunate to have the use of a reference genome to compare to. The human reference genome was first released in 2013 and has gone through a few iterations since then. The human reference genome is not the genome of one person. In fact, the current version is a composite of the genetic sequences of 13 different people, which means that all of us have differences between our genetic sequences and the reference genome. It serves as an important benchmark to refer to and makes sure that when my lab reports a variant, that a lab in another country knows exactly what we mean. So now that we understand what is a genetic variant, we have another concept to add to the mix, germline variation versus somatic variation. Germline genetics means those genes and alterations that were present in the embryo and are passed on to all of the cells. Somatic genetics refers to genes and alterations that are acquired over time and therefore affect some, but not all, of the cells in the body. We all have somatic genetic alterations that occur as our cells divide and as we live over time. Examples of somatic alterations which are clinically significant include those in cancer, in which the cancer cells have acquired genetic changes that fundamentally alter their behavior. Other examples include somatic mosaic disorders, like overgrowths, which affect some parts of the body, like only one leg. This is a nice depiction of how a cancer cell becomes a cancer cell. It begins as a normal cell, which carries with it all of the germline genetics that belong to that person. Alterations are acquired over time, some by chance, and some do due to exposures like smoking or UV radiation. At some point, there are enough alterations present to fundamentally change the behavior of that cell, including growing and dividing too much. It is important to understand that each cancer cell still contains the germline genetics as a background, even with all of those changes layered on top. This concept is very important to how we understand and interpret genetic alterations from cancer samples. Here is an example of one of our young patients with melanoma. As we just discussed, the tumor cells, here's one uh, in red, contain somatic changes and also include the background genetics of this child. Admixed amongst the tumor cells are also these lymphocytes, which are not tumor cells and contain only or mostly germline alterations. There are two implications here for our practice. First, a somatic variant, which is a driver of the tumor, even if it's present in every tumor cell, will be diluted in your sequencing data by non-tumor cells. Second, germline variants are present in this sample, and unless we take special efforts to mask them, they will become apparent, and we will have to think about how to address them. That's the end of our core concept session. Please join me for the associated advanced concept, how to address germline variants in tumor-only sequencing. This uh, seminar was brought to you by AMP Ed Education Online. Thank you.